Hello, I am Chris Belisle, Executive Director of Corporate Relations here at Asia Society. Today, I have the distinct pleasure to highlight a new series of business programs conceived through the expertise and recommendations of the Asia Society Business Council on the latest trends and innovations on business in Asia. Today is the first of a two-part conversation for which we have partnered with the Oklahoma, I'm sorry, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in the International House of Japan to present scientific innovations that will shed light on how the business environment will adapt as we enter the post-COVID-19 era. We are broadcasting from Tokyo, Okinawa, Singapore, and New York. Please tune in again tomorrow, June 23rd at 8 a.m. Uh, New York time uh, for part two of our program, which will build on today's discussion, but this time from the business perspective of COVID-19's effects on long-term business models guided by scientific research. To guide us through both sessions, I am absolutely delighted to introduce Bloomberg Senior Asia Economy Reporter, Michelle Jamrisco. Michelle tracks regional developments across trade, monetary policy, economic growth and development, infrastructure and innovation. Now based in Singapore, she spent seven years in the Washington DC Bureau covering the US economy, Congress and government procurement. And prior to Bloomberg, she was a White House correspondent for Kyoto News. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris, for that kind introduction. And I'm, I'm very happy to join you all from near and far. Uh, and, and understand it has to be virtually, and I hope all you and your families are keeping safe and well right now. So I'm especially excited about this panel of scientists today because it's become a bit of a cliche in my field and other non-science fields to introduce such commentary with, I'm not an epidemiologist, but, and then to move into some sort of analysis of what's happening in the science today and how that's impacting our lives. But today our extremely qualified panelists don't have that excuse. Uh, they come from science and engineering fields, and I'm delighted to pepper them with questions about their research, how they've been affected over the past few months, and how business and, and consumers can continue to grapple with this COVID-19 pandemic. So our panelists will be framing their answers based on their research and a timely and varied research at that and COVID. I'm sure a lot of our audience members are either familiar with our panelists or have read their bios on the material for this event. So I'll be brief in introducing them, but you'll notice that each of them has some affiliation with the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, one of our co-hosts of this event, as Chris says, and that their research has really taken them around the world. So please do submit questions via whichever platform you're joining us from, and we'll get to those later during the audience Q&A. We're trying to pack a lot into 90 minutes, so I'll just be brief here, but uh, just to introduce our panelists. First, we have Professor Mahesh Bundy, who grew up in India and has earned degrees in computer and electrical engineering and physics, including a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. He's worked in the Indian software industry and done research at Los, Alamo, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory and Harvard University before joining OIST in 2012, where he has an adjunct appointment with the International Center for Theoretical Physics. And by the way, in his free time, he advises two governments on energy policy. Dr. Faisal Mahmood comes to us from a biomedical perspective having earned his PhD from OIST and as a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University. He is an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And among his other affiliations, he's a full member of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Cancer Center. Dr. Amy Shen is a professor at OIST and heads the Microbio Nanofluidics Unit at the Graduate School. She earned her PhD in theoretical and applied mechanics from the University of Illinois, was a fellow at Harvard University, and taught at Washington University in St. Louis and the University of Washington in Seattle before moving to Okinawa in 2014. And finally, Dr. Matthias Wolf is an assistant professor at OIST and heads the Molecular Cryogenic Electron Microscopy Unit there. He was educated in Austria before receiving a PhD in biophysics at Brandeis University and then moving on to postdoctoral positions at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital Boston through 2011. So first, Welcome to all. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I want to start in, by taking us back to what seems so long ago, but early 2020. Um, and I'd like to ask each of you in turn to just briefly sum up how you came to hear about the virus, 
what memories you have about the expectations of how the situation would evolve and whether you had any sense that this would grow to be so large and have such a global impact as, uh, as it has. Mahesh, maybe you can start us off. Sure. Hi, Michelle, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me over. Uh, when did I first hear about the COVID-19 virus? It was uh, early January uh, about uh, the breakout in Wuhan. And uh, my first impression was, uh, uh, well, let's look up first what happened during the SARS uh, uh, breakout. Uh, I don't remember quite what happened, so I, I went and looked that up. Uh, how did I... Uh, uh, and then I was uh, traveling across the world uh, within Japan, US, uh, Taiwan, uh, and uh, as uh, weeks uh, went by and uh, the news gather started gathering steam, uh, the face masks came out and, uh, and then the world changed before we knew it. Great. Yeah, I do remember SARS being a specific reference point for a lot of us here in Asia and, and hoping that it would be at least that short, maybe even shorter. But unfortunately, we've kind of moved beyond uh, that comparison now. Uh, Faisala, would you, would you care to share your thoughts about where you were, what you were thinking at the time? Yeah, so I, uh, I found out about the virus uh, late December, early January, just like my, my said. Um, and I was also traveling quite a lot. Um, and... Uh, I, uh, I definitely did look up what what possibilities are um, out there in, in terms of previous viruses, but I did not anticipate it being um, as bad as it as it became. Um, of course, comparative analysis with uh, with other with other viruses, we know that the, the infiltration was, rate was much higher and it spread much faster now. Yeah. Right, right. And how about you, Amy? Um, Hi everyone, I'm Amy. Um, so, um, because I have several relatives in China, and um, my second cousin and his family actually live in Wuhan. So I learned about uh, the virus very close to Chinese New Year, and when things started getting bad and unfolding. And before the government kind of uh, uh, stopped people from sharing the videos on WeChat, so I got a lot of uh, kind of real time you know, hospital scenes and, uh, and also I, I learned, you know, there's a huge um, kind of demand for PPEs and masks and so on. Um, so my relatives told me it's getting really bad. And uh, so I figured it's probably going to just like a wave propagate globally. And since mm -hmm. at that time, China was still allowing uh, people traveling within China and also abroad. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of, I know it's going to come, but the matter is when. I didn't realize it's going to hit kind of the U.S., Italy, and Japan so quickly, um, the order of a couple months. And so I was right. mentally prepared, but just, uh, but not so well prepared that it's going to happen so soon. So you had a little bit more perspective from, from family and friends. Um, right, and, right. And we'll get to that uh, communication um, mm -hmm. issue a, a bit later when we talk about more of the challenges as well. Um, yes. Matthias, what was, what was your perspective at the start? Oh, you're, I believe you're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, similar. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, similar to Amy, when uh, when I heard through the news, it was early Janu January. You know, when I heard about the virus, and uh, uh, what was concerning really was when uh, the Chinese government published these numbers about the estimates for the the R naught, this uh, transmission number. And uh, uh, when I heard that it was on the order of three or four at the time, it wasn't quite clear what it was going to be. Now it turns out it's more like 2.5. But it was clear that this agent uh, was able to spread very quickly. And uh, it, it was actually pretty evident already at the time when they published the, the sequence uh, that uh, essentially the, the genie is out of the box and uh, Wuhan is this travel hub with connections to Japan and everywhere else. And of course we were next in line, you know, so I was concerned that uh, this is gonna come here and it was essentially just a matter of time. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to do something at the time, but there was of course not much, uh, no clear mandate for this. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it turned out then 
and also, you know, some structural biology groups. And I, I am a structural biologist. I do cryoelectromicroscopy, but also I have a background in virology and pharmacology. And uh, um, the, uh, the, these groups were extremely quick. So within two weeks, essentially, the first uh, structure was published early February. And at this point, I, I said I wanted to uh, contribute and uh, uh, actually when um, the first tests came out, um, the PCR tests, they use uh, as a, um, um, you know, as a, as a piece of the DNA that, uh, that they detect uh, the nuclear protein. And uh, because we have previously worked on Ebola virus uh, nuclear protein RNA complex in my lab, um, I thought that this would be an interesting target. And uh, we simply ordered the test kit and cloned the gene. And that's how it started for me. Wow. Okay, so a lot to think about when you when things all started. Uh, I'm sure as scientists, you were thinking on two tracks in terms of what you knew about past comparisons, as well as what you were hearing on the ground, whether it be from family and friends like Amy, or or just uh, you know from news reports and, and governments and, and other scientists. Um, so a lot going on all at that time. Uh, after we have that overview, I want to launch into our individual areas of research. So each of you have kind of tackled this in different ways, and it's uh, fascinating to hear how you're approaching this from your expertise uh, within the science fields. Um, Mahesh, I'll start with you. Your, your latest research has been focused more on developing uh, effective masks. Um, and this is something I think close to home now for a lot of consumers and businesses, if not every consumer and business. Um, and in a lot of our countries, including here in Singapore, we still have, of course, mandated mask wearing, in, at least in, in public or certain establishments uh, to get services. In the US, that's meant a whole cottage industry, it seems, of people making homemade masks um, and maybe not the best quality, but doing what they can to, to get those out there. So tell us a little bit about what you think the typical mask might have gotten wrong or might be uh, not as uh, you know, advanced as, as what you're working on and, and what sorts of qualities were you, were you trying to achieve with, uh, with this new mask that you're producing? The typical homemade cloth mask uh, uh, or even the surgical mask that we purchase at a commercial store has the problem that uh, when we put it on, uh, you can see me try one here, when we put it on, there are interstitial gaps between the uh, facial skin and, and the mask. So even though the mask itself can filter out uh, dust particles or bacteria or uh, virus, uh, viruses, uh, they can still, as we are inhaling the air, they, the, the particles and the viruses can get through the gaps. So uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have heard of uh, the N95 uh, filtering face piece uh, respirators by now. I was unaware of it until late February uh, when I happened to be in Trieste, Italy, to teach a school uh, uh, at the International Center for Theoretical Physics. And uh, that got uh, canceled and I flew back to Japan and uh, I couldn't find masks. And uh, curiosity got the better of me. I started digging into what, what is so special about the N95 mask. And what is special about it is uh, uh, several design features. So there are three ways a mask can filter out particles. One is uh, called inertial impaction. The second is called diffusion. But the third one is what makes the N95 respirator special, which is an electrocharged uh, filtration layer. So it attracts the dust particles and virus particles or the aerosols containing the viruses and bacteria and mm -hmm. traps them. And the second is uh, what I pointed out with that is missing in these uh, uh, surgical masks, which is present in these face piece respirators, which is a tight facial fit. So here is a 3D mock-up. So when I put this on, you can see that uh, I, I can basically close off the gaps between the uh, face and, and the mask. Mm. So... Uh, as I started digging in about the properties of these electrocharged layers, it uh, occurred to me that uh, this is manufactured through an industrially sophisticated method using polymers, which have static charge built into them. And the question came up, uh, well, is there a homemade or a simple lab-based lab design uh, that one could come up with that would, that if we put out the fabrication method out there, uh, uh, using common materials and simple methods, people are smart enough to uh, build their own systems. And there was a, a dearth of uh, N95 respirators at the time. All healthcare and emergency care personnel were uh, 
for being forced to reuse and decontaminate and reuse their, their respirators. Mm. And there was a serious shortage of uh, PPE in uh, Japan in particular, uh, in general, and Okinawa in particular. So I got busy making these uh, electrocharged uh, filtration fabrics. The usual method is uh, called melt blowing. That is industrially quite intricate. So we used actually a modified cotton candy machine, the simple machine we use to make candy floss or cotton candy. Instead of sugar, we put uh, polypropylene uh, or uh, discarded uh, plastic caps, which we crushed in a food processor and uh, threw into, after decontamination, we threw it into the cotton candy machine and we were getting these filtration fabrics. From there on, that was the one percent inspiration part. And from there on, it took us about uh, two and a half to three weeks to fine tune the process to, and start manufacturing the fabrics. And then we made these 3D printed face piece respirators. So this is a, a sample of the electrocharged fabric that we made. And to get the tight facial fit on this, we just would uh, place uh, the, uh, so basically we would just do it that way and, mm. uh, and, and, and go to work. So. These were not certified by certification agencies, so uh, uh, we could not uh, uh, do it uh, uh, on a large scale. Or, uh, but uh, we got uh, we, we kept uh, some of the people supplied who had nothing, and uh, we're glad we were of some use. Well, that's fantastic. I know you were talking about testing earlier. Have you? Can you tell us a little bit about that process uh, further and, and are you endeavoring to kind of distribute them more widely or what's the what's the production status at this point? So we have, uh, there were three motivations behind this work. The first was uh, to figure out a way to manufacture or fabricate these uh, electrocharged filtration fabrics uh, from simple mater uh, common materials and simple methods. The second was to put the know-how out there uh, uh, so we went through the web and uh, social media channels, Twitter feeds and Facebook to put the word out there. And there were teams across the world, especially from developing nations in uh, South America and Asia and Africa that took this up and started uh, developing. So we had a lot of uh, 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 calls and uh, email uh, requests from uh, groups uh, spread across the planet. And... Uh, the first couple of weeks were spent basically tinkering around because the kind of materials I had access to uh, were not available in, say, Kenya or in uh, 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 Argentina. So it, what were the uh, replacement parts we could use? So we were working with simple stuff like soda cans uh, or beer cans and uh, drills and, uh, uh, and going, to, going to work with them. The third was uh, this, uh, the co this cotton candy method is actually... A, a new way to fabricate these materials. And uh, then supply chain systems have broken down and uh, we cannot keep ourselves supplied with these masks uh, uh, through global supplies. Uh, we have to move to distributed local manufacturing. And that is where this cotton candy method comes in handy because mm -hmm. uh, building a, constructing a cotton candy machine is very simple. It's not rocket science at all. Well, I wanna ask you a, a kind of consumer based question. I understand, I mean, here in Asia, across many of our economies, uh, consumers are very familiar with wearing masks and uh, for health reasons, and especially during times of pandemic, you mentioned SARS earlier. Um, but throughout the world, we're seeing, you know, perhaps a little bit of resistance from people who are not used to having that on their face going in the public all the time. Uh, in fact, there's a discomfort and trouble breathing and that sort of thing. So how do you address that? I mean, with this new mask, is it is it any more difficult to breathe is it is was that one of the goals to to make it um you know more comfortable in some way or is is does that defeat the purpose essentially because you're you want to trap uh as much as you can uh from from getting out our goal was not specifically to make it easy for respiration or for breathing comfort uh it was more uh, from the desire uh, for the best possible protection and yes. when we tested uh, these uh uh, these respirators in the lab uh, for filtration tests, they did perform on par with uh, the N95 uh, standard. So that was our primary goal. We, uh, some respirators do come with uh, an open and shut valve that works like a gate. So you can mm. uh, breathe in through the filter, but when you're exhaling, it, the air goes out through the valve. Uh, that is, uh, it has its pros and cons. Uh, we chose not to put it in there. Uh, 
the advantage is that uh, it uh, it helps with breathing because it doesn't fog up your uh, uh, your face. But uh, on the downside, uh, that is, if uh, an infected person is wearing that kind of a mask with the valve, then they are going to exhale out the, the virus uh, aerosol mm. particles. Mm. So that is a concern. So many uh, many international uh, uh, like the uh, CDA. Uh, the, the, uh, many of these uh, uh, certification agencies actually mandate that N95 respirators used uh, inside uh, the isolation rooms and uh, 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 and uh, when treating people should not have these valves. Mm. Okay, well, it is encouraging to hear that you've been able to share the design uh, and we'll get again to the challenges later during COVID and communications challenges, but it seems like some of these channels are, are not uh, not ruined by a pandemic or, or cut off of travel. So that's great. So uh, Faisal, I want to turn to you and, and ask you about your research. So normally I understand you're centered more on uh, cancer diagnosis and uh, right now you're working more on in artificial intelligence for healthcare uh, and especially in pathology imaging. Can you Tell us a little bit more about um, how your maybe day-to-day -day has changed during the pandemic and, and what your main areas of focus are right now. Yeah, so uh, my lab works on using artificial intelligence and deep learning for pathology image analysis. We typically do this for cancer and all kinds of different inflammatory diseases re re ranging from the kidney to heart transplant and rejection and um, all kinds of different things. Um, so the way uh, that the pandemic has affected us, um, most of our operation is, is very, very computational. So we've continued to um, do everything from home. All my postdocs and PhD students are, uh, are, are working from home. Um, it, it has affected us to, to a degree where we have limited access to uh, patient samples, which are often coming off of surgeries and there are limited surgeries going on. Um, we have uh, we've done some work with uh, with COVID uh, COVID nineteen um, autos autopsy samples where we're trying to study that uh, uh, that, that how does uh, pathological manifestations change uh, in not not only in the lung but also in the liver and heart uh, and kidney uh, <coughs> when when patients get um, COVID nineteen and particularly trying to quantify um, how does it vary from, uh, from SARS and MERS, the two other coronaviruses, because uh, patients get acute respiratory distress syndrome, but uh, visually there are, there, there are limited differences uh, between, uh, b between autops autopsy samples from these different, different viruses. So we're trying to quantify if there's anything uh, subtle there that we can look at. So, I mean, you mentioned the timing in terms of infection and, and how, that, how the virus evolves. How much do we know on that right now? I know that's been a matter of debate and uncertainty uh, even in the science field for, for a few months now. Um, yeah, I I am uh, I'm, I'm not the best person to comment on that, but uh, it is true that we do uh, the, the information is, is is kind of evolving. I think uh, uh, Matthias can and can probably comment on that more. <laughs> in a more effective we'll way. get to his grilling yeah. too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So so give a sense too. Then um, you know how does your the the folks that you're working with and your staff how does that compare to usual times? Are you um, involving more people in this sort of research, or is it a more focused group than, than normal? Yeah, so um, we, we haven't involved uh, additional people to work on, work on COVID-related um, research. Uh, so, so it is uh, my lab, and we're, we're, we're just um, uh, trying to see if we can quantify some of these things for uh, people who are, who, are doing, who are taking more of a basic science approach towards the, uh, towards the COVID crisis, yeah. Great, great. And so the lab, I mean, what are, do you have deadlines coming up or a, a sense of how the project is going to move forward in, in the coming months? Yeah, so uh, we've been able to meet most of the deadlines uh, so far. Um, but uh, the, the research progress in, in, in general has slowed down because of, uh, because of COVID, both, both in terms of our research on, on, on cancer and other inflammatory diseases and 
uh, COVID research, of course, is, uh, is, is priority and uh, a lot of it is also limited by the amount of samples we have, uh, have available. A lot of artificial intelligence research is, is driven by availability of lots of data. Uh, mm. We're trying to collaborate more uh, from, uh, in, in terms of uh, getting data from um, multiple institutions. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating to use uh, AI and all these things are kind of coming together as we're talking about um, you know, a, a sort of digital revolution on many levels during the pandemic, but uh, being able to use that sort of technology in your, your current work. I mean, yeah. did you acquire any new equipment in, in the process or um, how, has, how has AI changed for you even the past uh, few months? Uh, no, we, we, we haven't acquired any uh, new equipment, but uh, AI is, is being used quite a lot for COVID research, ranging from social social media-based modeling uh, mm. and trying to predict which the uh, drugs can be repurposed because they have, to have a lot of existing data for this. So as they make small changes and uh, and get start to get data for from COVID patients, they can begin to predict which drugs are uh, are more likely to respond for certain kinds of patients. Uh, there, there's also some work on like X-ray uh, predicting uh, COVID from from X-rays early on, um, and then there's a lot, a lot of work going on on privacy, privacy preserving contact tracing and using mm -hmm. uh, electronic me uh, medical records and trying to predict how um, a de novo kind of disease like COVID would manifest in in different uh, uh, phenotypes that exist for these patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know a, a lot of our viewers are probably familiar with um, the contract tracing debate and the Google and Apple combining to for this uh, software that, that may or may not be taken up by uh, consumers and businesses. Um, where do you see that going forward? I mean, do you think at, at some point everyone will uh, be more comfortable with that sort of thing, or is this uh, a, you know a privacy debate that's going to win out? Yeah, so there's a lot of work going on right now on how they can use artificial intelligence to preserve privacy by uh, taking a more of a synthetic data-based based approach where the data is collected, but on the, on the end of the analysis, it's, it, it appears to be more, more of a synthetic rather than being related to a particular, particular person. Um, so uh, definitely there, there is a lot of value in contact tracing and uh, the more trust people place into the into the into the ability of, of these systems to preserve their privacy, the better. Yeah. Great. Well, it gives new meaning to to data scientists. The title, but uh, using that on many levels these days. Um, I just want to turn to one question we've gotten from the audience in the meantime uh, from YouTube. Michael Strauss asks, uh, "What is it? This is for uh, Mahesh. Uh, what is the time to print the conformal mask and time for the fabric? Uh, total time per mask for the production." So we can print about uh, 50 mask holders on a single object 500 3D printer uh, in about 10 hours. Uh, but the fabric, uh, the electrocharge filtration layers uh, uh, can be fabricated much quicker of the order of one sheet per minute. Uh, we were supplying uh, 3D, the 3D mask holders uh, with, the, uh, with the face fitting a tight fit shape only for uh, healthcare professionals, not for the common civilian population. So. Uh, so we only had to manufacture one mask per uh, healthcare uh, uh, personnel, and uh, we would supply the the filtration fabric every day. We, we would say use it for eight hours, throw it away, and replace it with the next one. Uh, so it was a one. This was a one-time job, but this was a recurring job. So it worked out uh, towards the end. Great, thank you for that. Amy, I'd like to turn to you and your research. Um, you know, you usually focus on fluid dynamics, but uh, you've gotten more into face shield production, as I understand it these days. And you told me that there there was a special you saw a special need at the start of all this, um, especially with the shortage early on in the U.S. and Europe as the virus moved to those parts. Um, we'll get to some of the special challenges again a, a little bit later. But um, tell us first what you were trying to ensure uh, you achieved with these face shield designs, what would be a bit different or, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what production snags you might've had uh, in terms of just designing it. Right. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Yeah. So, uh, so my primary research is in microfluidics, but we also do a lot of 3D use 3D printing to make small scale devices. So the lab next door to us, uh, mathematics, mechanics and materials unit, 
so they have a more bigger production of making bigger things uh, using 3D printers. And uh, so especially there's, um, so there's a research technician. So from Germany, his name is Michael uh, Grunwald. So he's actually primary, actually uh, technically in charge of the face shield project. And originally, so uh, the two groups, we started talking because we want to combine our 3D printers to mm -hmm. kind of, uh, uh, to increase the high, higher throughput and so our original plan was, uh, so my group and their group were going to make uh, kind of different PPEs. And so we decided kind of there kind of two things. One is uh, the face shield. Uh, since um, it doesn't need like FDA approval, we believe it's kind of like a lower hanging fruit. We can quickly make them and, mm. uh, and people can use them without any certificates or approval. And at the time, we're also designing some makeshift ventilators, but we understand that it's going to be very complicated. In particular, mm -hmm. in Japan, things are very rigorous and mm -hmm. might not go through the right channel to, to get to people who really need it. So that's kind of the, the original thought. So we started uh, exploring how can we make a face shield. So I, I brought, so this is kind of our product. And... Uh, and as you can see, there are three components. And so the visor part, and mm -hmm. so we, we have a, like a, a rubber band. And uh, so, so these two can easily acquire directly. For example, we can get the visor materials from even from Amazon. And we can mm. get rubber sheets and use laser cutter so we can make a simple design. That's also easy. But, mm. the, um, but the, the main component that's this uh, headband, um, so, so this is kind of like a, a single headband. And mm. so that requires um, a 3D printer um, to make them. And mm. uh, so actually by early, uh, by mid-March, and uh, so, um, so in Europe, there are already a lot of places. I, I think they were exploding with um, COVID-19 and the materials already became scarce. And mm. uh, so the healthcare workers can no longer um, purchase, um, for example, face shield or masks from the direct channels. And so there's a lot of grassroots effort. So people started putting out designs, uh, 3D printing designs online, mm. Uh, mm. especially. So, so we are being um, inspired by this particular design from uh, 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 Preser uh, International. And uh, so with different printers and uh, the design is slightly different. And uh, so we use that as an initial kind of reference point. And we started playing with also materials. And uh, so our goal is mainly to, so we want to make all the components reusable. Mm. And uh, so instead of just dispose, dispose them after one usage. And so wow. we try to select the right, better robust materials. They're all plastics, but better materials that they can sustain uh, disinfection over and over mm. and not degrade. Um, and so, so I, I guess, uh, so the main, um, uh, we can call that a little innovation uh, from our group making this headband is, so we, number one, we try to select the right materials and also improve the design. Um, mm. to make this uh, fa um, to, to make this headbands so we can use less materials because mm. if you remember so the materials became very scarce and hard to mm. acquire mm. and also to improve the printing time and uh, so in principle so with the standard kind of uh, available design online so for a single this kind of a uh, headband it takes using a small kind of 3d printer it takes 90 minutes per band oh, wow. so okay. that's taking too long so instead <laughs> so so we designed uh, so we made these stacks instead so so each round so uh, so we can make a stack of uh, eight to ten and then but of course we have to separate them mm. and uh, but so for each single one we can reduce the printing time down to 15 minutes mm. and mm. which is a big improvement when you think about if we need to print a thousand or a couple thousand uh, headbands and it becomes possible for us um, to to make enough for the for example for the local government for distribution and I so, imagine so, the, mm -hmm. 
I was just going to say, imagine the reusability is uh, critical for, for the yes. materials and location. Yeah, so, so actually uh, at the time, so one of my PhD students, um, so he's in the biomedical engineering field. And uh, so, um, so he actually spent a lot of time and used different types of disinfection protocols like fumigation or ethanol or heat treatment. So we put a kind of E. coli on different uh, surfaces mm -hmm. and uh, um, so it actually took a couple of weeks, very systematic studies and making wow. sure we have the right material. And because we also have to provide kind of a DIY um, type uh, manual, like a sheet, you know, mm. we send this to mm -hmm. the local government, you know, how to assemble them and, and how to also disinfect uh, right. each uh, yeah, uh, each materials. So we, before we provided that, we have to make sure you know, our protocol is robust because, you know, mm -hmm. because they will be delivered to the healthcare workers. And so right. that's a big responsibility mm -hmm. that we want to make sure everything is safe. We actually disinfected everything before we packaged them uh, mm -hmm. to deliver. To so I imagine a similar message would be sent to the businesses that acquire these masks or, or need them for their workers, right? I mean, is there anything that... Um, in particular that they should know about the, the sort of face shield that, that might be different from what they're used to wearing? Right. I think uh, if you look, uh, if you go to Amazon, you can, you can buy face shields now. I think now mm. that the supply chain is uh, becoming more normal. But a mm. lot of them, I think the materials are not as robust. And uh, so after maybe a, a few cycles and uh, some of them, they do not handle, for example, heat very well than the materials mm -hmm. because they're all basically different types of uh, thermoplastics like polymers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the higher quality versus kind of lower quality one makes a big difference. And you can actually see that from the, the pricing. And right. uh, some uh, face shields, you know, they range from a couple dollars to, you know, like a $20. And mm. um, uh, so I, I believe that the major difference is from the materials. I imagine the production time and the reusable quality yes. also mm -hmm. price. Interesting. So where are you at in terms of production uh, going forward? What, what do you envision will be your production schedule and, and testing uh -huh. if you need to do that further? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting question. So we first made uh, the face shield, uh, our first prototype was by late March. And mm. at the time, so we're working with uh, the doctor, Dr. Mori from Ois Clinic. And we presented that to him. And then he actually presented our prototypes to the local government uh, in early April. I think at the time, and uh, so in Okinawa, it became, I, I think uh, the situation became critical. And immediately they wanted us to provide 800 face shields. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. At the time, so we're thinking about, yeah, maybe we can provide a couple hundred because we, we didn't have that many printers or enough materials. And, uh, but uh, so after we got this pre-order 800, we, we decided we, we have to ramp up the production. So we actually um, sent an email to the entire OIS. We tried to get materials. Also, we tried to acquire materials globally. It's mainly mm -hmm. just the printing materials. There was a, a major shortage. Um, but anyway, so we were able to, to get enough materials and also uh, improve the design to make the first 800 uh, mm. face shields by mid-April. So we actually wow. work day and night, a lot of volunteers. Uh, so because yeah. there are many steps, uh, not only just printing and also assembly. And as I mentioned, uh, even working with uh, our university's communication division, they have to make the DIY very um, simple illustrations. And uh, so after we delivered the first batch, um, so we were asked by OPG that they wanted another 1350, you know, wow. more than a thousand. And, but we were able to, um, so, so there were actually some hip, hiccups I, I, I can explain later, you know, technical difficulties sure. and so on. But eventually, so, so um, more recently by mid-May, so we delivered the second kind of big order and so luckily, uh, so the government told us, and uh, so, so they were very grateful, but uh, um, so the Japanese health ministry is going to 
uh, they're able to provide more face shields uh, wow. starting mid-May. And uh, but meanwhile, so we we have been also so we have been also talking to um, a local um, company. So so they um, they do injection molding. So that's a lot. Uh, that's a better way if you want to ramp up the production on the order of uh, thousands or ten thousands. Wow. Uh, so we already made the design. So we have been talking with this local company because we believe that's also beneficial to boost the local economy. Mm. And to, um, so just in case, hopefully not, but if there's a second wave or there's any needs for, um, for more face shields, uh, so we believe we're ready, but instead of using 3D printers, you know, that's kind of still very um, low with lower production rate. And also, I think by the time we delivered more than 2,000 face shields, I think, um, so we, um, students, postdocs, and everyone, we had a little fatigue <laughs> by now, <laughs> like uh, just making face shields. But uh, we believe we have a better strategy. And uh, so we, the design is ready for the injection molding, and the company is also game for it. So if uh, there's a need or if we hear from the local government, so we will be ready to go. So also the materials we already acquired. So, mm. so because right. uh, so that's we believe easier. we're not ready for that. <laughs> Well, that's great. I mean, it's it's fascinating to see with each of you how the, the process started maybe in kind of a haphazard way. You just wanted to kind of achieve a certain goal short term, gather what you could. And now some of these things are hopefully getting easier in terms of resources, communication, testing, everything. Right. So that's, yeah. that's fantastic. Over time. Mm -hmm. So I'll, um, we'll move to Matthias. Uh, you're, you're coming at this, uh, the virus research from a structural biology standpoint, as you mentioned. And I know uh, you told me that after the gene sequencing of the virus was published, there was more talk of immunology and how to arm ourselves uh, with antibodies, at least until there's a vaccine. And we, we eagerly await that day. But until then, and even after, um, I understand you're just, your goal right now is to test 6,000 people in Okinawa, and uh, you've already run some preliminary tests with OIST staff, but uh, tell us a little bit about what your expectations are of the, the results of that and what, what you started with, what you were trying to do with this antibody test. Right, so um, I told you that um, my interest essentially started through the nuclear protein gene, and uh, we were the first ones because of this <coughs> to, to order this uh, plasmid from, uh, uh, actually, the WHO uh, PCR test, and uh, um, therefore we were the first ones to have a PCR test at OIST. And uh, so, testing was in the in the in the center of our my lab's um, concern very early on. And uh, we thought that uh, well, can we test? So you know, there was essentially an ethical question. So we had this tool to to perform a PCR test to detect whether any one of us had this disease or not, you know, because at the time there was a lot of fuss about this, you know, like uh, people were coughing, they had a, you know, they, they, they had a cold and they thought they had COVID. So, um, you know, everyone wanted to know, do I have COVID or not? And so I, I thought about this and I thought, well, you know, I could just take these reagents and test my lab and, uh, and not tell anyone <laughs> but <laughs> there's an ethical dilemma because uh, you know what what if if somebody is positive so mm -hmm. uh, then you have done this in an environment that is not set up for this you know essentially this is a so so called biosafety level 3 agent you know it needs to be treated under containment you as soon as you test and you have a positive you know essentially you have violated this rule that you have probably done it in your lab and um, in addition there is an obligation to um, to tell the rest of the community that there's a case because otherwise, um, you know, you may infect the rest of us. So essentially the consensus was we, we could not do this, you know, because uh, um, even if we, if we told somebody that there was a positive, you know, and, and there wasn't, you know, and we didn't test, but um, it would mean that OIST would have to shut down, shut down. <clears throat> essentially, you know, this is, uh, was as clear as, as anything. So uh, and, and another way of, of, of testing people is this serological test. And uh, at that time, uh, about mid-February, um, the lab of, of uh, Dr. Florian Kramer, Professor Kramer in uh, the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, 
um, who is also a, a fellow Austrian, um, and I, I, I don't know him personally, but uh, I read about uh, his paper, and uh, he, they were, his group were the first ones to develop this uh, serological assay for, for um, essentially testing how many and, and if there are any antibodies in patients who have been exposed to this virus. And uh, so I contacted him uh, early on because uh, they um, actually had this fantastic effort that they made available their, their reagents to, to the world. And, uh, you know, not only were they the first ones to, to, to create the, the actual procedure and the test kit, and, you know, the procedure is, is called ELISA. It's, it's a standard test that has been used for decades, essentially. It's, it detects the binding of antibodies to antigens. Uh, the antigens are in this case expressed uh, viral surface protein, the so-called spike protein. That mm. is what gives the coronavirus its name. You know, it's the, the spikes that make the crown uh, when you look at the particle in projection in an electron microscope. And, uh, you know, we do electron microscopy for a living. So, of course, I was interested in these proteins. And uh, so we, we got the plasmid from the Kramer lab and that took a while. Um, but yeah, so we, we got ready uh, with our expression system. And essentially the way this works, you know, for, for, for in layman's terms is that they sent us the DNA. They, they also kind of send, kindly sent us some purified protein to get started quicker. But um, the DNA is essentially the blueprint for the, pro, for the protein. So, so they sent us the DNA for the for the spike protein and that is a trimeric protein so it needs to assemble properly and it also needs to have the right uh, decoration of sugars <laughs> and my old uh, so I, I used to work on HIV glycoprotein before at Harvard Medical School which is a little bit similar um, and my old uh, advisor uh, Professor Stephen Harrison compared the, the glycosylation the sugar with uh, you know sugar coated M&Ms so essentially <laughs> Viruses they they cloak themselves in these glyc in these this these these sugar chains outside, which are sort of like a you know like like seaweed, you know, sort of they are sort of they they are unstructured and they are very hard for the immune system to to uh, to get a hold on and and so they cloak themselves like M and M's he call, he called it and uh, <laughs> so the chocolate is the protein but the sugar is the coating around it and in HIV this is quite prominent in coronavirus actually it has even more of these um, these sugar chains and so it is important to express these antigens properly so that they have these uh, they are decorated with these uh, sugars that contributes to the antigenicity and therefore or to the specific antibodies that somebody develops. So in other words, if you want to test for this new type of coronavirus, you should have a, uh, an antigen um, on, in your test, you know, that is uh, as close, closely resembles the virus, the viral protein as possible. And uh, so, so you have probably heard that there are various different tests, you know, including, you know, immunochromatographic tests, which are these paper strip tests. And they often, um, they often immobilize um, either only fractions of the, the spike protein or uh, it's dried down, so it's partly denatured. Um, and therefore, you know, the uh, antigen antibody recognition is less uh, specific <clears throat> and uh, the sensitivity of the test is also much lower. So uh, the, the Kramer lab established uh, a, a so-called two-step ELISA in which in the first step they use the receptor binding domain of the spike protein to capture essentially all antigens that are specific against this part of the spike. And uh, there is a, a small um, uh, false positive rate in, in this uh, step, but it essentially captures all the antigens that that recognize this this spike sort of the sensitivity is very high but to compensate for this uh, a little bit uh, you know this this too good detection if you want you know there's a second step that then rescreens the the false po the, the, these all the positives essentially um, in, in a proper way using using a dilution series and this is done done in in solution and it uses you know spectrophotometer and is a proper test that has a very high sensitivity and uh, selectivity also, and it has uh, it has um, 
um, a wide detection range. So um, we we implemented this following the the Kramanev protocol, mm -hmm. and uh, later got uh, a mandate from the Okinawan prefectural government to screen uh, about six thousand samples, and. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty was not so much, you know, establishing the test. You know, protein expression was was challenging in the beginning, but uh, we got this now uh, figured out. Uh, but the difficulty was, this is essentially human subject research, so we had to apply for all the necessary permits, and also we needed positive controls from the hospitals, which meant that you know they had to send us potentially infectious material, which uh, you know was treated in oyster in a special. Uh, facility that uh, was temporarily upgraded to um, the level that is necessary for for doing this and mm. uh, it turned out later you know first you can inactivate these by by heating them for for an hour to at 56 celsius and that's also mentioned in the Kramer protocol and and so it's safe to handle these reagents you know cons using using standard uh, biosafety level two uh, procedures um, so, so the limit for us was always samples. And so we, we, we did reach out to the local community and we will uh, run a survey to screen all of OIST essentially. Currently, so we also, we set up uh, uh, robotics using a li liquid handler to, to process now uh, about 4,000 samples every day. But um, we, we have so far only screened a few dozen. And most of those were negative, but we did find uh, two weekly positive ones. Mm. And so in the meantime, so what, what we did do maybe that is sort of, uh, can be can attributed to, to my lab is we, we made this, so we made a little test kit. So now I have, I have one here. So this is a bag and it's got, you know, it's got a tube, it's, it's got a tube. Um, it's called a so-called serum separation tube. You know, it uh, has it a- <laughs> Say again. Almost a do-it-yourself uh, kit, huh? Yes. Yeah. So, 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 and I can show you. So, essentially, the kit, it it uses this, um, you know, it uses this this finger pricking device, and you just, you put it on, on on your finger, and you, and you click, and then you see this, this this doesn't hurt at all, but you know, there you can squeeze out a little drop of blood, and mm. essentially this goes into, it goes into this this into the serum tube, and uh, yeah, I, I need a little bit more than this, but. Uh, 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 once uh, the blood drops are at the bottom, um, these tubes are good for at least a week. You can keep this at room temperature even. So it's possible to mail this kit to people and the content of this bag is only about uh, $2. And so we made this so that we have a, a barcode there and uh, essentially people can pick up one of these bags and then they... Uh, they scan a QR code and they can watch a video how, how it works. And uh, this is completely anonymous. They put a sticker that is unique to each, each test uh, onto the tube and then they drop off the tube at OIST and then we would, we would screen it. So we are still um, waiting for the, for the permission for, for doing this um, on the scale of OIST. But mm -hmm. in principle, this could also be scaled up. And the advantage is that uh, this mode of testing combines a robust uh, ELISA-based test. ELISA means uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So mm -hmm. that is uh, more sensitive and, and, and better than um, the, the immunochromatographic tests. Um, so uh, we hope that we can capture a range of, of cases, not only the strongly positive ones, but maybe also weakly positive ones. Yes, and uh, besides that, uh, we have uh, five uh, COVID projects, you know, st structural biology projects, including the ELISA, and we have worked very hard through the shutdown at OIST. Also, we had a shutdown for about six weeks. Mm. Um, yeah, which was good for us because we had, you know, essentially priority access to the microscopes. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know uh, it's not pleasant working under these conditions, of course. Yeah. And so oh, we're very glad that now OIST is back. <laughs> And you, you, you keep saying OIST, and I know, I know you all are using the OIST term just for our viewers. That's, of course, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Oh. Uh, they're all, they're yes, all I'm sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, and, and uh, it's fascinating to hear, too, uh, from all of you, but Matthias, this really hits home, is the sort of balance that you're trying to strike in a lot of ways. Um, 
you mentioned the sensitivity of the, the test, you know, not too sensitive, but sensitive enough to capture just the right, um, you know, amount of infection and, and level of infection. Um, and of course, the ethics, uh, constantly a question that we've talked about with all the panelists. Um, you know, you want to be thorough enough, but um, sometimes you run up against rules and regulations and comfort levels and uh, data privacy. So um, you can certainly appreciate the, the balances you're trying to strike. I do want to, we want to leave time for enough questions. Um, and uh, we've already had quite a few uh, entered via different platforms. But the last thing I, I want to kind of get to is, of course, these, these special, special challenges. And some of you have mentioned them. Um, Particularly with travel uh, still largely uh, restricted, um, you know, a lot of you, and I know Mahesh, you, you've traveled quite a bit and you typically travel quite a bit. Um, that has been kind of closed off for you. And uh, I, can, I can hear and I can see that you've interacted with uh, some of the communities of scientists all over the world that you normally would. Um, and that's great that you've been able to share that research. But um, both in the research side and the communications, as well as the staffing, the resources, uh, I know, Amy, you have stories about that. I mean, what what has really been uh, especially tough um, as you're trying to go through this, and sometimes ironically so, when you're trying to achieve something um, to help, uh, you know, mitigate the effects of COVID, but it's uniquely challenging because of COVID. Um, Amy, maybe you can start off with uh, some of the anecdotes that, that you have um, for the production. Okay, process. yeah, so, so during, yeah, this pandemic, while we're trying to make face shields, and so, the, so to us, there are two kind of major challenges. So one is the, the shortage of uh, the printing materials. And uh, so it's very interesting. So by mid-March, I decided we need to order a lot of printing materials, even before we started kind of ramping up the production. So we're actually able to make uh, a lot of orders uh, directly through this uh, company, uh, Brule Japan, so, uh, so it's a company, they kind of, um, they handle kind of, uh, you know, the third party, you know, without the additive manufacturing, they, they sell printers, um, um, those are made from US and Europe, but they also acquire quality printing materials. And uh, so we made the order, but a couple of weeks later, we're told only one third of the orders can be honored because they were running mm -hmm. out of materials. And so that's kind of the, one of the major challenges. And then we started looking elsewhere, just globally. And um, turns out Amazon is actually a, actually a, a good place. So we, we got some materials from them. And uh, so mainly we just focused on the materials, not through kind of the official like a distribution channel. And mm. it turns out the quality is not the greatest. Uh, we mm. learn the lesson later. <laughs> And, uh, um, but, but we work with a, a lot of vendors within Japan and outside Japan, you know, from China, from Europe. So, but that mm. was definitely extremely difficult because I think every, everyone globally was also looking for these, um, you know, similar polymer plastic materials to print mm -hmm. PPEs and so on. Yeah, so, so that's one challenge I think everybody was facing. And, but, but I think by now, after basically starting in early May, things kind of uh, uh, got relaxed a little. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so I think the supply chain is, I think not completely back to normal, but uh, uh, it has improved. And also including the delivery time. So before the pandemic, usually it takes one to two weeks for delivery to Okinawa. But mm -hmm. uh, so during April, it would take uh, at least five, six weeks. Uh, what are you thinking uh, longer term? Uh, because I know this is a question that businesses are asking right now too, is mm -hmm. how do you source your materials? How do I rejigger my supply chain to make it more resilient? We hear a lot about resiliency in, in my field and economy, mm -hmm. in economy reporting. Um, but what, I mean, what are you thinking in terms of the government's mindset toward keeping enough of a stockpile of those types of resources for their home constituencies, but also keeping open trade channels and allowing their businesses to freely uh, trade in goods? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think hopefully, I, I think everybody uh, has been, I, I think it's a, a big lesson. So during the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, everyone was learning. Um, so based on my understanding, most PPE kind of supply materials were primary, I think, uh, based in China and Southeast uh, um, Asia. Mm -hmm. and. 
And uh, I, I think after the COVID-19 started in China, of course, you know, there is a, a major shortage, uh, the supply um, from China, and it right. propagates all over the world. Um, mm. So I'm hoping also now uh, it can make, uh, you know, the government and, and, and also kind of local governments think about how to promote local economies, local mm. manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I think that will help and also promote, lo um, I, I think, uh, I think uh, the companies and, and maybe also focus on maybe innovation and uh, R&D type mm. uh, uh, development. Um, so combined, of course, I think uh, we still have to rely on some existing kind of uh, the, the basis, you know, from, from China and from the, the normal supply chains. But I think it's a very good time, you know, for everyone to think about. Uh, so due to this pandemic, what uh, can everyone do to mm. alleviate this kind of problems uh, for just to reduce the long-term impact? Well, it seems like several of you have 3D printers at the ready. Uh, I wonder if that's going to be more uh, common for even even households in the near future. If we might we might have to. Yes, wait I, a I I think so because um, so I think there are a, a lot of uh, students, for example, and mm. uh, so so they purchase uh, 3D printers. I uh, so as you can see, there's like online community and people want yeah. to contribute. And right. they have been playing, uh, you know, with different designs, sharing them, you know, open source online. So we shared also our design mm. and so for everyone to use. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a lot of uh, kind of uh, grassroots movement because people uh, want to help and uh, mm -hmm. help with, the, you know, the, the healthcare workers and to, you know, protect the general public. And, and yeah, so, so going back to your question, so, so the, the shortage of the printing materials, that's one major challenge. And mm. uh, so in addition, so also related to the materials, the quality of the materials, we also face the, the printing job like a breakdown. So mm. after uh, two, three weeks of uh, kind of 24 hour nonstop printing, and mm. uh, so we, we actually, yeah, so by the way, so we, we pulled seven printers, you know, within OIS and within the university community, people, you know, from other units very generously, you know, lent the 3D printers. So we put them, so in a new lab space at the time it was the new building just opened up, nobody was occupying. So we mm. put that in a location we call that as a farm. And, and so, so we're able to work with IT people for remote control monitoring the printing process. And, uh, but unfortunately, um, so starting early May, so in Okinawa, we started the rainy season. And mm -hmm. so with the new building, the humidity and temperature was not uh, very well controlled yet. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we encountered, you know, uh, initiated by the humidity. So that kind of uh, interfered with the, the printing process. And so we started seeing clogging and uh, with the print heads. And eventually, mm -hmm. so one day, all seven printers stopped working, you know, around mm -hmm. midnight. And mm -hmm. uh, so, which means, uh, so the next day we had to fix it. So we, we lost, for example, 12 hours. And then the problem kept uh, happening. And uh, so we, we have to print, uh, we have to clean the print heads. So, so that definitely kind of uh, reduced our printing capacity. So mm -hmm. we know this, that's kind of a, a, a very interesting engineering problem. And also because, so um, after three weeks printing, so we ran out of uh, the higher quality materials. So mm -hmm. we, we used some of the, uh, the Amazon ordered materials. They're not exactly kind of uh, catered towards the specific printer, but it's just for the general kind of materials. They're also cheaper. And definitely, mm. so we see a major difference, you know, how they interact with the, with the printers and so on. Right. Well, as it's pouring rain outside here in Singapore right now, I can uh, certainly relate yes, to the, the, the problems of big climate. Yet. <laughs> That's right. Well, we were starting to get in uh, several questions from um, different platforms here. I want to kind of integrate them into the conversation. Um, okay. First, I'll just say that um, Matthias, we have a viewer from Facebook that appreciates uh, that they that you did the live blood test. Uh, this viewer says it reminds me of one that Governor Cuomo did on, on live TV. Oh, so, um, 
certainly a connection, I think, that a scientist can make with uh, materials and businesses. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, one question, interesting question from, uh, from Facebook also from David was asking, um, what are each of your expectations uh, about the timeline for a, a vaccine? I mean, is it something that uh, we can expect, uh, you know, in the next few months or when, when might it be available? And what are the key lessons you've learned so far from this pandemic that might help you better prepare for the next one? I, if I saw, maybe you want to take that one first. I know you, you, this is something that you might be thinking about quite acutely. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think that, um, that there, there is a lot of effort uh, towards a vaccine, but I, 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 I don't see uh, a solution uh, before early, um, early next year. And um, in, in terms of uh, going forward, um, I, I, I think we'll, we'll learn a lot, uh, not only in terms of the data that will be available in terms of contact tracing and all of that uh, information, but also um, in terms of just being more, more prepared. I know there was a lot of talk about uh, something like this happening for a very long time. And now that it has happened, we'll just go into the next pandemic in a much more prepared way. And, um, both on the on, on the econo economic and the governmental end, but also on the scientific end, uh, we'll have appropriate tools available to uh, to address uh, some of these challenges. Is there anything that you think um, you know this scientific process during COVID has really advanced in terms of what we're going to do next time, and what what might be different? Um, you know, I, I dare to say that the next pandemic, uh, <laughs> what what might what might we be more prepared for specifically? Um, I mean, given the fact that a large scale pandemic was so so long ago that um, we, we we didn't realize how um, how something like this could affect our daily daily, daily lives. I think I think going forward. Um, if something like this happens, having early realization would be would be kind of key. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Matthias, I know you've um, talked about this before. Uh, how many vaccines might be in the works um, around the world? Right. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts yeah, so on um, who might who I'm, might? I'm actually it? more optimistic on 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 both points. I mean, first maybe the sort of uh, how how do we react in the future? I think if you look at uh, the Asian countries, in particular you know, Japan and Taiwan and South Korea, um, they have handled this very well. And uh, you know, in, in in Taiwan, they had I think a single person die, and in in Okinawa, uh, we had a total of 143 cases, and we haven't had any in the last six weeks. So now, of course, you know, this is much easier if you're an island. You know, you can mm -hmm. shut down your your borders and control this much more rigorously. But uh, Taiwan, uh, before COVID even, you know, there was the swine flu and they had, they had uh, at the airports rigorous temperature controls, which were not installed in the United States until I think even May and, uh, or April. So um, the fact that the Asian countries were confronted with uh, the first SARS version prepared them to deal much better uh, with COVID. And mm. I think uh, this is a lesson that can be extrapolated to the rest of the world because now, you know, we know uh, what this means and the damage that it can do not only to public health, but also to the economy. And I think uh, if there should be another sign for another virus and sooner or later, you know, there will be something like this. It's unavoidable, you know, there's constantly new pathogens uh, emerging and uh, sooner or later there will be another one. But I, I believe in that case, um, each country who has experienced COVID, they will be much more cautious and they will be much quicker to uh, out of the start, you know, out of the gates to to fight this disease. So uh, in this respect, I'm I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that the next one, you know, will be. Um, I would say easier to fight, but you know uh, the countries with the governments will be much better prepared, and mm. and we also know that uh, the time to react is critical. You know, the delay that uh, happened in, in, in several countries in the world, you know, has damaged the, uh, the, you know, has caused many, many additional unnecessary deaths that uh, are now visible in these uh, curves that one can, can see uh, in the statistics online. But uh, about the vaccine, so I'm actually, so I'm, I'm genuinely an optimist always. And uh, 
I'm convinced that as, as of today, the, the vaccine that we, we will need or that we need that, that fights this exists already. So, you know, there's more than 200 now um, known vaccine efforts. And one of them has got to work. You know, I, uh, I'm convinced this is the case. Uh, and the problem is that you cannot roll this out overnight. And, you know, these are, you cannot just do human experiments. You know, this has to be tested first in animals, in mice, and in, in primates, and then in, in very sick people, and then, you know, finally in different groups, you know, in, in old ones and, and young ones, and, and uh, different genders, different, different countries. And so I, I'm convinced that sooner or later this, this will become a reality. I, I think, you know, like everyone agrees that a, a time span of, of one year is sort of ambitious for, to go through, through this, this licensing process. Also, in addition, you know, to produce these vaccines is, is, is a humongous logistical talk, you know, you, a task. You, you cannot just, uh, you know, make them in the lab and then supply, supply it to the world. You know, this does not mm -hmm. work. You need, you know, massive industrial capacity. I think in the end it will be like this, that there will be not one vaccine, but multiple vaccines. And, you know, the, the production will hopefully be open source or somehow licensed so that countries can produce them on their own in parallel, because mm. I think that's the only way how, how this massive demand can be satisfied. Mm. Um, but um, it is also true that, you know, this, these particular so-called class one fusion proteins that exist also in Ebola virus and in, in, in HIV and, 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 uh, and other respiratory virus, they, uh, they are notoriously tricky and, and they are a really ingenious uh, contraption by nature, you know, sort of they, they have sort of a cap on top that shields the actual fusion apparatus mm -hmm. and uh, they go through, through a cleavage process where they change their, uh, their shape uh, dramatically. And uh, so for, for the immune system, this is not one protein that, is, that it needs to see and it needs to neutralize. You know, it, uh, there are multiple guises of this uh, protein as it goes through its conformational changes. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe the, the main difficulty. So, so most of these so-called neutralizing antibodies they work by binding to some intermediate states in this in this transition, and they mm -hmm. sort of jam the mechanism and don't let it happen. Um, another difficulty is that uh, the virus has uh, two main entry pathways. You know, one is receptor mediated that attaches to this uh, ACE two receptor that is that's in the lung and everywhere, more in most mostly everywhere in the body. You know, in the kidney, and uh, so that's why when this goes awry. Uh, the disease is so devastating, but especially especially in the lung, you know, like the, the people cannot breathe anymore. And uh, um, so, the other pathway is a, is a pH induced pathway. And uh, if if you block only one, you know, if if only one of them is is in, interrupted, there's still the other one. So so it's a tricky problem to uh, to to uh, to target this, you know, uh, with a drug uh, or with a immunological therapy. But I'm, I'm confident that, you know, with uh, the amount of effort that is currently being put into this worldwide, that es essentially now already uh, 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 probably this, this agent exists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, many labs are, are working on recombinant proteins, on, on RNA-based protein um, therapies, on, on, on drugs. And the other thing is the, the, the therapies in general. You know, you can... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the UK, they found now that the uh, immunosuppressive drug called dex dexamethasone, you know, also has a, uh, uh, a, a, a an effect. Uh, at least one person in eight, I think, uh, survives mm -hmm. uh, on average uh, when given this drug in uh, the, the, the late stages of the disease. And, and there are others that are being investigated in massive uh, surveys. But... Um, yeah, one, one question is maybe, you know, why is it less here in Asia? Um, well, for once, I, I think the previous experience with SARS has, has uh, helped a lot because uh, the reaction was much quicker. And actually in February, it was early February when the Diamond Princess, the famous cruise ship, docked in Okinawa and uh, 
2,000 of its pas passengers supposedly walked the city of Naha. And mm -hmm. uh, this was before, you know, the big outbreak in Japan. And uh, so actually, it did not catch on in Okinawa. There were only a total of 140 cases. So we, we don't know exactly what it is that uh, um, apparently prevents or like makes the transition more difficult, the, the transmission more difficult here in, in, in Okinawa and in Japan. But uh, one thing is the, the rigorous behavior of people, you know, in terms of uh, wearing masks, in terms of washing right. hands, social distancing. And this is part of the culture here. And uh, I think uh, there is no magic bullet, you know, there is no um, uh, difference, uh, the genetic difference or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's mostly the cultural habits and the knowledge that uh, this has happened before. Well, certainly a lot of, right, a lot of variables. To, yes, yeah, yeah, a lot of variables to account for, especially with COVID. And um, I can appreciate your cautious optimism. So hopefully um, <laughs> something will come through. At that point, a lot of what you mentioned, Matthias, is um, kind of feeds into this next pair of questions from YouTube. Um, how can scientists ensure their voices and expertise are heard by local and national governments? And what advice do you have as we prepare for a new normal in the face of COVID-19? Uh, Mahesh, I want to ask you um, this, these pair of questions first, especially as you have a lot of contact with uh, governments and uh, you travel quite a bit. Um, I, I'm sure you all travel quite a bit in normal times, but um, I understand your your travel schedule was uh, busy right up to the to the start of of the outbreak. Um, so, what is your sense of how governments are actually listening to these things? Um, are, are taking this feedback as as uh, Matthias was talking about about early and aggressive action and whether they've perhaps learned their lesson going forward in that sense and, and will listen more to scientists. And... Uh, you know, it was Winston Churchill who once said that scientific advisors should be kept on tap, not on top. <laughs> so uh, starting with that comment of his, uh, what we scientists uh, do is uh, sit in our ivory tower uh, in our deep dungeons in the laboratories and go about our work. But uh, there is uh, uh, a barrier to cross in getting our message across to policy makers, decision makers. And uh, often uh, uh, we have uh, useful things to say, but uh, I think a lot of uh, uh, effort needs to be invested in uh, in bringing the scientists and uh, the academics uh, w together with the policymakers and the titans of industry, the business people, to to make the transition, uh, to get, to get the uh, information across. And uh, I think this pandemic brought forth the importance of that, and I hope certainly that uh, uh, scientists will play an increasing role in advisory capacity with governments and uh, businesses. About uh, the risks uh, going forward, uh, I, I think I personally feel businesses should uh, pay attention to uh, the need for more ethical business practices going forward. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. We know, for example, that the Ebola outbreak, uh, uh, the first Ebola outbreaks in West Africa started at the farm forest perimeters and there is a need to control deforestation. And I can, I can make a projection. This is not the last time we are going to see a, a, a virus viral pandemic. It's not the first time. Uh, on average, two viruses jump across from animals to humans per year. The question is uh, how virulent they are. And uh, the virulence is going to emerge again uh, with climate change and uh, uh, global warming. The tropical diseases are going to start moving towards northern latitudes, uh, or if you're in the southern hemisphere, to southern latitudes, and we have to be prepared for it. And hopefully, mm -hmm. this was a wake up call for all of us. Uh, so, the projection I would make where would the next, uh, where is the next uh, virus likely to emerge from, from the deforestation problem? Unfortunately for us, Asia has done an exceptional job of deforestation. I expect the next virus to come from the Amazon. Mm. So these are things to watch out for. Very interesting. I'm cautious there. Um, I, I actually want to interject something. I mean, so I'm, I'm incredibly proud of uh, being a colleague of, colleague of Mahesh and Amy and, and Faisal. You know, I mean, if you look at us, you know, we are from all over the world. You know, we are different 
this come from different disciplines, from different cultures, and we are all sort of working together. I think one of the greatest um, uh, threats to making scientists heard is that uh, this access is um, abolished. You know, this, this international immigration and uh, um, welcoming of scientists from, from all over the world in, in different countries is, is stopped. And uh, so the recent policy in the United States, you know, of, uh, you know, limiting uh, um, visas to, to postdocs and, and professors even, you know, just to immigrants uh, is very worrisome because, you know, that undermines the very basis of science, which is collaboration. And, mm -hmm. you know, COVID is a great example that there are no borders, you know, this problem does not have any, uh, any borders or rest restraints, you know, it just crosses borders without, without asking. And uh, I think we can only address this together. Uh, there, this is not a single country problem. And, uh, you know, keeping talented people out of the country does not help. So I think, you know, it is very important to not only make scientists give, you know, make scientists heard to, 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 to value these, these expert opinions, but, uh, but not to block them to come into the country. And, and I think uh, this may do even more damage to the economy than, uh, than the disease themselves, because, you know, it affects directly jobs and uh, perspectives in the future. Mm. So, um, that is a bit uh, of a politically uh, political statement, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, it's all tied together. Um, and and science by itself uh, is not enough. You know, it it must be made heard, and it must be heard by the ones who have the power. Well, it's certainly a message we hear in the business community as well. And I, I thank you for offering a nice segue into our final question, <laughs> uh, which is which is going to be a good bridge for our, our second session uh, that will go on in a half day. But uh, Sean King from YouTube asks, uh, people have shown they can work from home, but how will companies foster and maintain their corporate cultures going forward? And I wonder, um, I know you all could come from more of a scientist perspective than you would a, a business or a corporate perspective, but... Do any of you have uh, thoughts or insights on that um, as we kind of look to learn the lessons from science and take them into the business field as well as uh, just day-to-day -day, day -day lives? How might the business environment change? Or, or what are your hopes for the business environment to change uh, in the post-COVID world that, that, that they'll take these lessons going forward? I think uh, I, I can start off while my colleagues are uh, cranking their brains. Uh, at least speaking for Japan, where uh, there's a famous culture for uh, uh, that shows a strong work ethic of long uh, work hours at the office. Uh, Hitachi, I think, has announced uh, that uh, it is going to uh, relax those uh, requirements, as they put it, and uh, encourage more uh, working from home. But uh, and. Yes, as Sean says, it is, uh, people have shown that they can work from home, but it is not ideal. There is, uh, the flexibility is uh, uh, useful. It is important. Uh, I don't think uh, one should go the ex one, one extreme way as the, the Japanese workplaces do it. Uh, but it is also not uh, 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 healthy if we go the other extreme way where everybody works uh, from home. There is a good... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a there's a mental health side to uh, uh, to separating out our uh, uh, personal lives from our work lives, where so that we can focus on our work when we're at a, we are at the workplace. Uh, so I, I think uh, going forward, there is a case to be made for uh, uh, working from home or uh, more flexibility. Because it cuts down uh, carbon emissions, uh, it, it has uh, an impact on the global carbon footprint, and uh, it gives people uh, more flexibility. I think it also brings in more inclusivity, especially uh, uh, the issue of uh, 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 the gender and uh, 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 where uh, our uh, women colleagues are usually, uh, uh, they, they could find more flexibility if uh, given the freedom to uh, 
remote, work remotely. Mm. Uh, so let me stop there and let my colleagues chip in. Yeah, who else would like to chime in on that? Ho hopes and dreams for the post-COVID business place. Yeah, maybe I, 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 I uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Amy. No, go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I will be quick. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I fully agree with Mahesh. I think, uh, um, so with this pandemic, I, I think, uh, so what we see is that having fle flexibility is very important uh, to be able from home, and but on the other hand, I I, I agree it's it, it's also important. You know, we don't go to the you know the extremes. I, I think it's important for uh, for everyone, not just from the corporate environment and uh, and also academic environment. It's important to kind of human to human interactions. You get new ideas. You I, I think uh, the you, you get new. Um, um, you know, projects, ideas, you know, just from talking to each other or, or just being out. So you, your brain is exposed to new information and new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so uh, along the same line, so when we talk about kind of the border control at the moment, you know, a lot of countries, including Japan, is kind of closed, only Japanese citizens can fly back and so on. Um, so I, I, I think to deal with this kind of crisis, I understand. So the government has to to do something, right? So, so that uh, um, the the infection doesn't kind of explode. But long term, I do think we need to have a more uh, integrated approach. And uh, so, for for example, yeah. So I, I think if, if each country closes its border, so it's, uh, I think in terms of the the intellectual environment exchange. And for example, student recruiting, even just from a very localized point of view, and for new faculty recruiting and uh, scientific exchanges, it becomes extremely difficult. Mm. And mm. Uh, uh, but instead, we I think the government and other agencies should think about you know how to ensure the safety of the public, you know, by testing, by promoting social distancing and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, other ways instead of just, uh, you know, blindly, just, just kind of, uh, you know, black and white, we, right. we're not allowing anyone in and out. So I think that's also an extreme measure. So it won't be healthy long term. Thank you for that. Uh, we have uh, just just about one minute left, but uh, Matthias uh, Faisal, did you have anything to add to, to that? Looking forward. Well, uh, just uh, uh, I want to <coughs> excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm extremely grateful that uh, the Japanese government is giving us this opportunity to work together here at Oyster, you know, which is uh, sort of this international place that you know it's an app. You know, uh, it's 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 really a dream for 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 scientists and uh, uh, and also Okinawa. Actually, today is is Ire no 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 he. It's 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 a, the day of remembrance in Okinawa. You know, it's, it's a seventy five years the past the Battle of Okinawa, and I think what better place there is, you know, to to celebrate you know international uh, unity and. Uh, you know the the science in general um, than here, um, because I think these problems don't go away, and we can only address them together. Um, so I am uh, I am very grateful uh, to be here, and and that the government uh, of Japan, you know, has decided to, you know, peacefully. Uh, address problems in the world, and I think, you know, as the population growth uh, grows, these problems will not go away, and uh, we we can only solve this together. And I think the Asian society and uh, um, our the countries here in this corner of the world, you know, they they have uh, maybe uh, because of the history and because of the past diseases also, you know, they have a better grip about this right now. And uh, maybe in the, in the future, uh, this will, uh, this, 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 this new normal sort of will, um, will become sort of normal again. <laughs> so I don't know how to say this, but uh, uh, I'm confident that things will return to normal. But uh, uh, I think it's only possible if we work together and embrace each That's other. Great.
I know that's appreciated. A, a viewer from Facebook did say uh, good points from Matthias Wolf about what the world can learn from some countries in Asia and their response to COVID-19, a good area for future study. So that was that was appreciated. Uh, Faisal, did you have anything you wanted to add to, to help close us? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I would like to echo what my colleague said, and particularly what Amy was saying, that uh, the collaborative flow of ideas, which is so fundamental to, to science, has been kind of hindered by the pandemic. Yeah. All right, so certainly a lot of mes messages around collaboration. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap things up there. I, I certainly have learned a lot today for sure, and I'm sure our audience also has been digesting a lot of uh, what you've what you've shared with us. Um, a few takeaways for me. Um, I mean, I know we talked a lot about striking balances today, um, you know, not just work from home versus office, but also scientific efficacy versus data privacy concerns, um, flexibility and resiliency, and how to, how to balance all these things at once as businesses, as consumers, as scientists. Um, we heard a lot about, uh, you know, production snags and, and challenges, unique challenges during the pandemic, but also about what we might improve on going forward in future pandemics. Um, and I understand a lot of this was around early and aggressive action, um, doing what you can at the start, and then in a very scientific processing way, uh, modifying your, your trials, going through uh, trials and tribulations and, and, and modifying your processes uh, for the better. Um, and essentially what you all said in the, in the closing um, was a good message for business so that the effort that we need to strike to communicate across the scientific community, the business community, the government, um, and, and of course consumers on the ground. Um, so that that effort at communications, so of course, not lost on, on this journalist um, to, to kind of keep those channels open. So I just want to thank our panelists, so first and foremost, for all the fascinating presentations and, and everything that you're doing to, to try to make our lives better uh, during and after this pandemic. Thank you also to the Asia Society and the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology for making sure that we had this conversation today. And I encourage all our viewers to, to join us in, in less than half a day's time for the second part of this conversation as we explore how businesses are and, and will be conducting long-term planning um, based on these new scientific realities that we've undertaken uh, during COVID and that we discussed today. So that second session will be at 8 a.m. Tuesday in New York. Um, and until then, please stay healthy and, and thank you for being a part of this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>